We are living in a world which is driven by science and technology. Whether we realize it or not, our lives are being shaped by the research being carried out by scientists very often working behind the closed doors of their laboratories. May it be the quality of air that you're breathing, or a medicine that you're taking, or the latest artificial intelligence app on your mobile phone. All of these and much more are being produced by the intelligence of scientists. Now, would it not be really exciting to have a glimpse into this wonderful world of science? Through Science Insights, we shall bring to you the latest news about science and the work of scientists in Mauritius. This year is a very important year for the community of scientists because 2019 has been declared the International Year of the Periodic Table by the United Nations. In fact, this year marks 150 years since Dmitry Mendeleev first classified the elements according to their atomic weights in terms of the periodic table. But what is important that we know is that the periodic table is not a mere listing of elements, but it is a very clever classification of elements in rows called periods and columns called groups so that we can predict the properties and reactivities of the elements found in the periodic table. We know that the periodic table is kind of an iconic representation for scientists today. They are found in all the chemistry laboratories that we know. Let us learn today more about this very useful tool of scientists called the periodic table. The Rajiv Gandhi Science Center, where several activities have been organized to commemorate the International Year of the Periodic Table, among which is an exhibition on the periodic table. Let us talk to Dr. Mulu, the director of the Rajiv Gandhi Science Center, to get some more details about these activities. Our philosophy at the center is uh, not uh, the paper and pen uh, style, but it's mainly the mind and the hands-on approach. That's the philosophy of the center. And when you talk of the mind and hands-on approach, this is where the exhibition comes into play. The exhibition, what it's got, of course, it triggers lots of things uh, about the periodic table itself. And uh, when I say triggers lots of things, of course, if you ask a layman what is a periodic table, they'll have different versions. And some will be scared by the word periodic table itself. What is it? What are elements? What are these things? And then when you, when you put it in a, in, a, in a format that's pleasing to the people, that's attractive, that's in a layman's language, that's playful, huh? 
where people can touch, can read, can play, and uh, have fun. Uh, by having fun, you learn what is the importance of an element. This is where Rajiv Gandhi has its role, and this is where the uniqueness asset. And this is where all our activities have been designed around this theme. And there are many activities that have been designed. The, the exhibition, such an exhibition is one of the activities, the main one. And it was, I can say, this exhibition is unique in Mauritius and maybe part in the world because it was totally developed in-house by our personnel, by our technical staff. And uh, the, from the research work to the finished product that you can see, it's 100% in-house. So, uh, like we say in Mauritius, it's made in Maurice. The elements found in the periodic table make up everything found in this universe. They are in fact present in every facet and every field of our lives. May it be medicine, technology, agriculture and so many other fields that we can think of. So let us hear a bit more about these elements from the scientists of the Rajiv Gandhi Science Centre. It all started in the 18th century when Antoine Lavoisier, who was a French scientist, attempted to group the then known elements into metals, non-metals and gases. He was also the first one to write an extensive list of the then known elements. De Bruyne was the first one to classify the elements according to their chemical properties. After him, Alexandre Émile de Champcourtois tried to classify the elements based on their atomic mass. He was the first person in the year 1862 who classified the elements according to their mass and he also produced an early form of the periodic table which he called as the Terulic helix. In 1869, Mendeleev published his version of the periodic table. However, the interesting part of it was that he left empty spaces in his version of the table for the elements who were yet to be discovered. Indeed, after him, many other scientists discovered elements which completely fit in the existing periodic table. Indeed, there have been some changes in the periodic table that Mendeleev produced. However, those changes are very minor. There is one scientist, Albert Gyozo, who discovered a 12 elements along with other scientists and their elements completely fit in the periodic table. As a matter of fact, when Mendeleev produced his table, at that time only 63 elements were discovered and today we have 118 elements in the modern periodic table. Women scientists had indeed their own tremendous contribution in the field of science. On the top of the list is Marie Curie. She was born in Poland and she was the first woman to be awarded the Nobel Prize and the only person to be awarded the Nobel Prize twice, one being in the field of chemistry for the discovery of the elements polonium and radium, the other one being in the field of physics for the theory of radioactivity. She, along with her husband, founded the Curie Institute. And to honor her, the element curium was named after her. The next woman scientist I would like to talk about is Lise Meitner. She was born in Austria, and she was a pioneer in her field, that is physics. She formed part of the team that led to the discovery of nuclear fission. Although it is Otto Hahn that won the Nobel Prize for nuclear fission, but it was Liz Meitner who actually coined the term nuclear fission and explained the concept of nuclear fission. Although she never won the Nobel Prize for it, but to honor her, the element meitnerium was named after her. 
Like her, there are many women scientists that led to the contribution that had their own impact in the field of science. Like you have Ida Nudak, Margaret Perry, you have Rosalind Franklin. Women had their huge contribution in the field of science. An element is a few substances that are made up of single types of atom. Elements form the building blocks of all the rest of matter that you found in the world. All these elements originated out from space. 14 billion years ago, the universe was formed, what we call a Big Bang. At that time, light elements such as hydrogen and helium were formed. The temperature during the formation of the universe was extremely high. Now, as time passes, the temperature cooled down, and these cosmic gases, like hydrogen and helium, they've condensed together to form stars. And stars, they group together to form what you call galaxies. Inside the stars, the lighter elements, such as hydrogen and helium, they stay there for uh, millions of years. Light elements, like hydrogen, they fuse together to form helium. Now this process is called a thermonuclear reaction and the temperature are very, very high, millions of degrees centigrade. Inside massive stars, we have the formation of elements like uh, carbon, oxygen, and so on, up to iron. When these massive stars run out of energy after millions of years, what happens is that they explode. And these explosions are called supernova explosion. And in the process, they release lots of energy and also heavier elements such as gold and uranium. These elements are expelled out in the space. And later on, we have these elements that, that they form the second generation of stars and the planets. So what you see here, all the elements that in the Earth they were formed some billions of years ago, deep inside the core of stars that are now dead. We have elements up to uranium that are naturally occurring that are found on the Earth. But beyond uranium, that are called super heavy elements, they do not occur naturally. Now, how are they produced or how are they synthesized? We use what we call particle accelerators. What they do, they take lighter elements, they fuse together, okay, collide them together, make them into heavy elements. Now, these heavy elements, they are, they are short-lived. Okay? They have short lifetime, up to order of seconds or even a fraction of seconds. The human body is made up of elements. For example, carbon is the basic unit of life. Then carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen, they are elements which combine to form molecules like proteins, carbohydrates, fats, and lipids, which are found in our body tissues, in the cells, and in the body. On top of that, we have elements which are essential part, um, which are important for body functions. For example, iron is, is the central molecule in the in hemoglobin, which is in our red blood cells. Uh, sodium, potassium, and calcium, they are important for regulating the pH and electro electrolyte balance in our body. That's why we are asked to control our salt intake, uh, because salt, table salt is sodium chloride, for example. Now, calcium and phosphorus, they are uh, e essential components of our bones and teeth. About 60% of our body weight is made up of water, and water uh, is composed of um, hydrogen and oxygen. So these are the elements in our body. On top of that, uh, we also need a proper balance of elements for nerve impulses, for electrical signals to pass on uh, correctly in the body. So just like the human body, plants also are made up of elements. For example, the cell walls of plant cells 
comprised of cellulose, and cellulose is another compound uh, made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Uh, plants also, as we know, they carry out photosynthesis, which is a process where they manufacture their food. And uh, for photosynthesis to take place, we need chlorophyll. And magnesium is uh, a central component of the chlorophyll molecule. In addition, now plants need elements to grow well, to grow healthy and uh, hale and hearty. So the elements nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are needed in large amounts by plants uh, for healthy growth. That's why we have farmers and planters which use the fertilizer NPK. It's the common name of, for the fertilizer for healthy growth of plants. These are macro uh, elements. On top of that, we have the micro elements or trace elements which are needed in smaller amounts by plants but which are yet essential for their, for their growth. For example, we need uh, elements like manganese, molybdenum, uh, iron for the growth of plants, for healthy leaves, for ripening of fruits, for fruit development, for pollen formation, for root development. So all the different processes that take plants place in the life of a plant at different stages they need different elements. You wouldn't believe uh, how elements touch the lives of human beings right from the time we wake up in the morning until we go to sleep. The toothpaste that you use to brush your teeth has a large amount of fluorine in, in it. The tap that you use where the water comes is made up of elements. The eggs that you eat uh, has a large amount of sulfur, for example. Now, if you're sick, you're taking medication. It's uh, the work of scientists who have uh, combined elements and form compounds which will help your health. Uh, cosmetics, dyes in your clothes for your hair, all these are, are made up of elements. On top of that, uh, scientists have modified elements and invented uh, new compounds and materials, like we had silicone. At the time, we were talking about silicone revolution. Uh, silicone is used in lubricants, in uh, industry. Uh, now we have little molds to make nice uh, cakes. Uh, we also have aluminium, uh, which, which is widely used in the uh, aeroplane making. We also have the elements like iron and steel, which is an, uh, an alloy of, of iron. And the strength make it uh, very useful materials uh, in the construction industry. Recently, in 2010, there were two scientists who got the Nobel Prize for the production of uh, an allotrope of carbon, which we call graphene. The advantage of graphene is that it is known as the strongest man-made material that is currently known. It is one atom thick, yet it, is, it can be stretched by 10%. Uh, it is very strong, it is malleable, and it just opens a window to opportunities um, we, just, we just cannot imagine. For example, you can have curved screen, you can have, um, uh, it's used in prosthetics, in medicine, in satellites, and we just, uh, currently we just don't know where graphene can take us in the future. Let's take our smartphone, for example. In a phone, you've got the screen, you've got the electronic circuit, you've got the casing, you've got uh, different components. And all these components uh, comprise of elements like copper, like manganese, like in the battery, you have lithium uh, battery, you have uh, other rare, rare elements as well. While scientists are using the elements and the compounds for the benefit of humanity, we also have to be very careful about the impact that we are having on, on society. For example, in the nuclear industry, they produce a lot of radioactive materials which need to be contained and properly um, discarded. So if, if we don't take the precautions, we run the risk of having major accidents. We had the Fukushima in, in 2011 and we all know about the Chernobyl incident as well. On top of that, we have to be very careful about chemical weapons, which can be very disastrous to humankind. Another problem that we've had with the element is the release of CFCs in the atmosphere, chlorofluorocarbons, which are destroying the ozone layer. So while science is benefiting 
mankind, we must also take utmost care and precaution to protect our Earth and humanity as well. This year, 2019, is very special as the periodic table helps us in our everyday life. The periodic table can be said to be one of the most significant scientific discovery. And the periodic table is the language of all the scientists. Since the advent of Mendeley periodic table, various scientists have been able to isolate and understand chemical elements better. Mendeley left gaps in his periodic table so as to be able to discover new elements and from groups and periods, their chemical and physical properties such as density, melting point or boiling point could be determined or even predicted. Relating to the extraction of the metals or elements from their respective ores, the process would be a lot easier due to the knowledge of their properties in advance. Therefore, the predictable can be viewed as a very powerful scientific tool and I would say that uh, it is a wonderful discovery by Mendeley. Long ago, life was very difficult for scientists. They had a very hard way to study any kind of chemicals that were present in the environment and also that make us the world that we know. During that time, before the periodic table came to existence, they had no way to classify or to organize any kind of elements that was present. So now, in our, in our modern era, we are lucky that we have been uh, able to develop such a table that has been able to classify the elements into such a way that it also facilitates the, in a way, research exams, studies, and especially for the student life. It carries with it a series of many, many elements, many chemicals, and also many substances that can be used in, the, in daily life and also in a way to cater for studies and exams and self-formation. And in a way, the predictable is easily understandable by anybody across the world. Being illiterate or iterate by the full simplification of the predictable in many ways, many people are now able to understand what is written on the predictable and also make it's a good thing as it makes more and more people knowledgeable on chemistry worldwide. We have elements up to uranium that are naturally occurring that are found on the Earth. But beyond uranium that are called super heavy elements, they do not occur naturally. Now, how are they produced or how are they synthesized? We use what we call particle accelerators. What they do, they take lighter elements, they fuse together, okay, collide them together, make them into heavy elements. Now, these heavy elements, they are, they are short-lived. Okay? They have short lifetime up to order of second or even a fraction of seconds. Indeed, since 1944, several new elements have been synthesized by the process of nuclear fusion in particle accelerators, with the first one being the element curium that was made from plutonium. The latest additions to the periodic table came in 2016 with the addition of four new elements, nihonium, muscovium, tenesium and organesium. Since the days of Mendeleev, the periodic table has considerably evolved and it is the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry that are responsible for the update of the periodic table. The current periodic table has space for exactly 118 elements. And since 2016, all these 118 spaces are now fully occupied. This means that if a new element is synthesized, the shape of the periodic table as we know it today will have to change 
to accommodate the new additions. In the program today, we have learned how the periodic table has revolutionized the way that we understand the universe. Science and technology surely has in store for us several more discoveries and inventions that will shape our future. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>